Hello all, before we begin this episode, I would just like to ask our listeners to like and subscribe to this channel as it will help us out. We are fairly new on YouTube and it would help us a lot if you did so. You can also comment if you prefer. Thank you. Welcome in the Great Khan's Tent. History, Literature and Storytelling in the Great Khan's Tent is now available on YouTube. You can find us using this podcast name. Fear not, listeners, episodes will still be released on this podcast first, and it is only after a delay of a week that I will upload them onto YouTube. You can still find us on all your podcast providers first. Are you interested in getting the book you just published reviewed? Writing some piece of literature and need help getting it out there and promoted? Interested in sharing what piece of literature we should cover next? Well, fret not. In the Great Khan's Tent is now available on Patreon, where your contribution can help in growing this podcast. For as low as $3 a month, a price less than a good, and I mean good, cup of coffee, you can help contribute to the growth of this podcast. Every bit helps, but as always, it is not necessary to do so, but will be appreciated. Find the Patreon link on our website, on our social media accounts, or email us and we can send it to you. Thank you. If you have any suggestions, comments, or complaints, please be sure to email us at all lowercase in the great Hans tent at gmail.com. That is in the great Hans tent at gmail.com. We would love to hear from our listeners. Thank you for listening, and now, on with the show. In this episode, we begin the story of the third royal dervish with knight 15 and knight 16. Note that the third royal dervish is the first instance we encounter of a hero who enjoys sailing, owns ships, and is subsequently shipwrecked. This clearly shows that the fundamental ideas that are found in orphan stories like Sinbad do have some basis in the 1001 Nights. We also encounter, for the first time, the mythological bird called Ruch or Rock, again a staple in the Sinbad and other stories as well. Keep in mind here what the third royal dervish is attempting to convey and how it differs from the first and second royal dervishes stories. Auzubillah min ash-shaytan nirajim bismillahirrahman nirrahim In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Praise be to God, the beneficent king, the creator of the universe, who has raised the heavens without pillars and spread out the earth as a bed. And blessings and peace be upon the Lord of Apostles, our Lord and Master Muhammad Sallam and his family. Blessings and peace, enduring and constant unto the day of judgment. Of a verity, the doings of the ancients become a lesson to those that follow after, so that men look upon the admonitory events that have happened to others and take warning, and come to the knowledge of what befell bygone peoples and are restrained thereby. So glory be to him who hath appointed the things that have been done aforetime for an example to those that have come after. And of these admonitory instances are the histories called the Thousand and One Nights, with all their store of illustrious fables and relations. Sherzad continued, I traversed various regions, and passed through great cities, and bent my course to the abode of peace, Baghdad, in the hope of obtaining an interview with the Prince of the Faithful, that I might relate to him all that had befallen me. I arrived at the city tonight, and I found this first companion of mine standing in perplexity. I greeted him and talked to him, and then our third companion arrived, greeted us, and told us that he was a stranger. So are we, the two of us said, and we have only just come on this blessed night. The three of us then walked together, without knowing each other's stories, until fate brought us to this door, and we came into your presence. This, then, is the reason 
why my beard and moustache have been shaven and my eye gouged out. The third dervish then advanced and thus related his story, the story of the third royal dervish. O oh, illustrious lady, my story is not like those of my two companions, but more wonderful. The course of fate and destiny brought upon them events against which they could not guard. But as to myself, the shaving of my beard and the loss of my eye were occasioned by my provoking fate and misfortune, and the cause was this. I was a sultan and the son of a sultan, and when my father died, I succeeded to his throne and governed my subjects with justice and beneficence. I took pleasure in sea voyages, and my capital was on the shore of an extensive sea, interspersed with fortified and garrisoned islands, which I desired for my amusement to visit. I had fifty merchant ships, fifty smaller pleasure boats, and a hundred and fifty warships. It so happened that I decided to go on a pleasure trip to the islands, and I therefore embarked with a fleet of ten ships and took with me provisions sufficient for a whole month. I proceeded twenty days, after which there arose against us a contrary wind, and cross winds blew against us, and the sea became very rough with tumultuous waves, and we were plunged into thick darkness. Despairing of life, I said, a man who courts danger is not to be praised even if he comes out safely. We called on the Almighty Allah and implored his help, but the wind continued to shift and the waves to clash together until daybreak. At daybreak it ceased and the sea became calm and the sun came out. We arrived at an island where we landed and cooked some provisions and ate, after which we remained there two days. Then we continued our voyage, and when twenty more days had passed, we found ourselves in strange waters unknown to the captain, and desired the watch to look out from the masthead. So he went aloft, and when he had come down, he said to the captain, I saw on my right hand fish floating upon the surface of the water, and looking towards the midst of the sea, I perceived something looming in the distance sometimes black and sometimes white. When the captain heard of this report of the watch, he threw his turban on the deck and plucked his beard and said to those who were with him, Receive warning of our destruction which will befall all of us. Not one will escape. So saying, he began to weep and all of us in like manner bewailed our lot. I desired him to inform us of that which the watch had seen. O oh, my lord, he replied, know that we have wandered from our course since the commencement of the contrary wind that was followed in the morning by a calm, in consequence of which we remained stationary two days from the period we have deviated from our course for twenty-one days, and we have no wind to carry us back from the fate which awaits us after this day. Tomorrow we shall arrive at a mountain of black stone called Lodestone. The current is now bearing us violently towards it and the ship will fall in pieces, and every nail in them will fly to the mountain and adhere to it. For Allah hath given to the lodestone a secret property by virtue of which everything of iron is attracted towards it. On that mountain is such a quantity of iron that no one knoweth but Allah, whose name be exalted. For from times of old great numbers of ships have been destroyed by the influence of that mountain. There is upon the summit of the mountain a cupola of brass supported by ten columns, and upon the top of this cupola is a horseman upon a horse of brass, having in his hand a brazen spear, and upon his breast suspended by a tablet of lead, upon which are engraved mysterious names and talismans. 
and as long, O Sultan, as this horseman remains upon the horse, so long will every ship that approaches be destroyed with every person on board, and all the iron contained in it will cleave to the mountain. No one will be safe until the horseman shall have fallen from the horse. Then the captain wept bitterly, and we felt assured that our destruction was inevitable, and every one of us bade adieu to his friend. Each of us said farewell to his comrades and left his final instructions in case one should escape. We had no sleep that night, and on the following morning, we drew near to the mountain, the current carried us towards it with violence, and when the ships were almost close to it, under the cliffs, they fell asunder, and the nails and everything else that was of iron flew from them towards the lodestone. It was near the close of day when the ships fell in pieces. Some of us were drowned, some escaped, but the greater number were drowned, and those who saved their lives none knew what became of the others. So stupefied were they by the waves and the boisterous wind. As for myself, O my mistress, Allah, whose name be exalted, spared me on account of the trouble and torment and affliction that he had predestined to befell me. I placed myself upon a plank, and the wind and the waves cast it upon the mountain. I found a practicable way to the summit, resembling steps cut in the rock, so I exclaimed in the name of Allah and offered up a prayer and attempted the ascent, holding fast by the notches. Night 15 Morning now dawned, and Shahrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say. Then, when it was the fifteenth night, she continued, I have heard, O auspicious Shahanshah, that while the other guests waited, tied up with the slaves standing by, their heads with drawn swords, the third royal dervish said, And presently Allah stilled the winds, and asserted me in my endeavors, so that I arrived in safety at the summit. Rejoicing greatly in my escape, I immediately entered the kapola and performed the prayers of two rakahs in gratitude to Allah for my preservation, after which I slept beneath the kapola and heard a voice saying to me, O son of Hasib, when thou awakest from thy sleep, dig beneath thy feet, and thou wilt find a bow of brass and three arrows of lead, whereon are engraved talismans. Then take the bow and the arrows, and shoot at the horseman that is upon the top of the cupola, and relieve mankind from this great affliction. For when thou hast shot at the horseman, he will fall into the sea, the bow will also fall, and do thou bury it in its place. And as soon as thou hast done this, the sea will swell and rise until it attains the summit of the mountain, and there will appear upon it a boat bearing a man, different from him who hath here cast down and he will come to thee having an oar in his hand. Then do thou embark with him, but utter not the name of Allah, and he will convey thee in ten days to a safe sea, where on thy arrival thou wilt find one who will take thee to thy city. All this shall be done if thou utter not the name of Allah. Awakening from my sleep, I sprang up and did as the voice had directed, I shot at the horseman, and he fell into the sea, and the bow having fallen from my hand, I buried it. The sea then became troubled, and rose to the summit of the mountain, and when I had stood waiting there a little while, I beheld a boat in the midst of the sea, approaching me. I praised Allah, whose name be exalted, and when the boat came to me, I found in it a man of brass with a tablet of lead upon his breast, engraven with names and talismans. Without uttering a word, I embarked in the boat, and the man rowed me ten consecutive days, after which I beheld the islands of security, whereupon in the excess of my joy I exclaimed, In the name of Allah, there is no deity but Allah. 
Allah is the most great. And as soon as I had done this, he cast me out of the boat and sank in the sea. Being able to swim, I swam until night, when my arms and shoulders were tired, and in this perilous situation, I repeated the profession of the faith and gave myself up as lost. But the sea arose with the violence of the wind, and a wave like a vast castle threw me upon the land in order to the accomplishment of the purpose of Allah. I ascended the shore, and after I had wrung out my clothes and spread them upon the ground to dry, I slept, and in the morning I put on my clothes again, and looking about to see which way I should go, I found a tract covered with trees to which I advanced, and when I had walked around it, I found that I was upon a small island in the midst of the sea, upon which I said within myself, Every time that I escape from one calamity, I fall into another that is worse. But while I was reflecting upon my unfortunate case, and wishing for death, I beheld a vessel bearing a number of men. I arose immediately, and climbed into a tree, and lo, the vessel came to the shore, and there landed from it ten black slaves bearing axes. They proceeded to the middle of the island, and digging up the earth, uncovered and lifted up a trap door, after which they returned to the vessel, and brought from it bread and flour, and clarified butter, and honey, and sheep, and utensils, and everything that the wants of an inhabitant would require, and that someone living in the underground chamber would need, continuing to pass backwards and forwards between the vessel and the trap door, bringing loads of the former and entering the latter, until they had removed all the stores from the ship. Then they came out of the vessel with various clothes of the most beautiful description, and in the midst of them was an old sheikh, enfeebled and wasted by extreme age. He was wearing a tattered blue robe, through which the winds blew east and west, as the poet has said. What shudders are produced by time, and time is strong and violent. I used to walk without weakness, but now I am weak and cannot walk. The old man's hand was being held by a youth, cast in the mould of graceful symmetry and of splendour and perfection and invested with such perfect beauty as deserved to be the subject for proverbs. He was like a fresh and slender twig, enchanting and captivating every heart by his elegant form. He was like a tender branch, enchanting every heart with his grace and enslaving all minds with his coquetry. As the poet has said, Beauty was brought to be measured against him, but bowed its head in shame. It was asked, Have you seen anything like this beauty? It answered, No. The party proceeded to the trap door, and entering it became concealed from my eyes. They remained beneath about two hours or more, after which the sheikh and the slaves came out, but the youth came not with them and they replaced the earth and embarked and set sail. Soon after I descended from the tree and went to the excavation. I excavated the soil, removed it, and worked patiently until I had cleared it all away. There was a trap door made of wood and as big as a millstone. When I lifted it, I could see under it, to my astonishment, a vaulted stone staircase, and entering the aperture, saw a flight of wooden steps which I descended. Down this I went until I reached the bottom, and at the bottom I beheld a handsome dwelling place, furnished with a variety of silken carpets, and there was a youth sitting on a raised dais, leaning back against a round cushion, holding a fan in his hand, with nosegays and scented herbs set before him, and with sweet-smelling flowers and fruits placed before him. He was alone, and, on seeing me, his countenance became pale, but I saluted him, and said, Let thy mind be composed, O my master. 
Thou hast nothing to fear, O delight of my eye, for I am a man, and the son of a sultan like thyself. Fate had impelled me to thee, that I may cheer thee in thy solitude. The youth, when he heard me thus address him, and was convinced that I was one of his own species, rejoiced exceedingly at my arrival. His color returned, and desiring me to approach him, he said, O oh, my brother, my story is wonderful. My father is a jeweler. He had slaves who made voyages by his orders for the purposes of commerce, black and white, acting for him, sailing to the farthest of lands with his goods, traveling with camels and carrying vast stores of wealth. And he had dealings with sultans, but he had never been blessed with a son. And he dreamt that he was soon to have a son, but one whose life would be short, and he awoke sorrowful. Shortly after, in accordance with the decrees of Allah, my mother conceived me, and when her time was complete, she gave birth to me, and my father was greatly rejoiced. He gave banquets and fed the medicants and the poor, because so near the end of his life he had been granted this gift. Then he summoned all the astrologers and astronomers, the sages and those who could cast a horoscope. They investigated my horoscope. The astrologers, however, came to him and said, Thy son will live fifteen years. His fate is intimated by the fact that there is in the sea a mountain called the Mountain of Lodestone, whereupon is a horseman on a horse of brass, on the former of which is a tablet of lead suspended to his neck, and when the horseman shall be thrown down from his horse, thy son will be slain. The person who is to slay him is he who will throw down the horseman, and his name is Sultan Ajib, the son of Sultan Hasib. But if he escapes, his life will be a long one. My father was greatly afflicted at this announcement, and when he had reared me until I had nearly attained the age of fifteen years, the astrologers came again and informed him that the horseman had fallen into the sea, and that it had been thrown down by Sultan Ajib, the son of Sultan Hasib. On hearing which, he prepared for me this dwelling, and here left me to remain until the completion of the term, of which there now remain ten days. All of this he did from fear lest Sultan Ajib should kill me. When I heard this, I was filled with wonder and said within myself, I am Sultan Ajib, the son of Sultan Hasib, and it was I who threw down the horseman. But by Allah I will neither kill him nor do him any injury. Then said I to the youth, Far from thee be both destruction and harm, if it be the will of Allah, whose name be exalted. Thou hast nothing to fear. May you be preserved from disease and destruction. And if Allah Almighty wills it, you will not see care, sorrow, or confusion. I will remain with thee to serve thee and will go forth with thee to thy father, and beg of him to send me back to my country, for the which he will obtain a reward. The youth rejoiced at my words, and I sat and conversed with him until night, when I got up, set light to a large candle and lit lamps. After having brought out some food, we sat down to a meal, and we then ate some sweetmeats which I had produced. We kept talking until most of the night had passed, and I spread his bed for him, and covered him, and slept near to his side. And in the morning I heated some water, and he washed his face, and said to me, May Allah requite thee for me with every blessing. If I escape from Sultan Ajib, I will make my father reward thee with abundant favors. But if I die... May my blessing be on you even so. Never, I replied, may the day arrive that would bring thee misfortune. 
May there never be a day on which evil strikes you, and may Allah will it that the day of my death comes before yours. I produced some food and we ate, and I got him to perfume himself with incense. I then placed before him some refreshments, and after we had eaten together, we passed the day conversing with the utmost cheerfulness. Then I made a drought board for him. He and I started to play, going on until nightfall, when I got up, lit the lamps, and brought out some more food. The astrologers lied, I said to myself, for by Allah I shall never kill this boy. I continued to serve him, to act as his companion, and to talk with him for nine days, and on the tenth day the youth rejoiced at finding himself in safety, and said to me, Thanks be to Allah my brother, who hath saved me from death, and this is because of your blessing, and the blessing brought by your arrival. I pray that Allah may restore you to your own land. O oh, my brother, I wish that thou wouldest in thy kindness Warm for me some water, that I may wash myself and change my clothes, for I have smelt the odor of escape from death in consequence of thy assistance. With pleasure, I replied, and I arose and warmed up a great quantity of water and brought it to him. He had a good bath using lupin flour, and I helped by rubbing him down and bringing him a change of clothes, after which he entered a place concealed from my view. I made up a high couch for him, and having washed himself and changed his clothes, laid himself upon the mattress to rest after his bath. He then said to me, Cut up for me, O my brother, a watermelon, and mix its juice with some sugar. So I arose, and taking a melon, brought it upon a plate, and said to him, Knowest thou, O my master, where is the knife? See, it is here, he answered, upon the shelf over my head. I sprung up hastily and took it from its sheath, and as I was drawing back, my foot slipped as Allah had decreed, and I fell upon the youth, grasping in my hand the knife which entered his body, and he died instantly. When I perceived that he was dead and that I had killed him, I uttered a loud shriek and beat my face and rent my clothes, saying, To Allah we belong, and to him do we return. This is indeed a calamity. Oh, what a calamity! O oh, my Lord, I employ thy pardon, and declare to thee my innocence of his death. Would that I died before him! How long shall I devour trouble after trouble? O oh, Muslims, this handsome youth had only a single night left of the dangerous period, and the astrologers and sages had predicted for him, and his death came at my hands. How I wish I had not tried to cut this melon. This is an agonizing disaster, but it came about in order that Allah's decree might be fulfilled. Night 16 Morning now dawned, and Shehrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say. Then, when it was the sixteenth night, she continued, I have heard, O auspicious Shanshah, that the third royal dervish told the lady of the house. With these reflections, I ascended the steps, and having replaced the trap door, returned to my first station, and looked over the sea, where I saw the vessel that had come before approaching, and cleaving the waves in its rapid course. Upon this I said within myself, now will the men come forth from this vessel, and find the youth slain, and they will slay me also. So I climbed into a tree, and concealed myself among its leaves, and sat there till the vessel arrived, and cast anchor, when the slaves landed with the old sheikh, the father of the youth, and went to the place, and removed the earth. They were surprised at finding it moist, and when they had descended the steps, they discovered the youth lying on his back, exhibiting a face beaming with beauty, although dead, and clad in white and clean clothing, with the knife remaining in his body. 
They all wept at the sight, and the father fell down in a swoon, which lasted so long that the slaves thought he was dead. At length, however, he recovered and came out with the slaves, who had wrapped the body of the youth in his clothes. But when he saw his son laid out, he fell to the ground, poured earth on his head, struck his face, and plucked out his beard, while the thought that his son had been killed caused his tears to flow faster and he fainted again. One of the slaves got up and spread a piece of silk on a couch, upon which they laid the old man and then sat by his head. While all this was going on, I was in the tree above them, watching what was happening. Because of the cares and sorrows that I had suffered, my heart turned grey before my hair, and I recited, How many hidden acts of grace does Allah perform, whose secrets are too subtle to be grasped by clever men? How often in the morning trouble comes, while in the evening follows joy? How many times does hardship turn to ease, as pleasures follow the sad heart's distress. The old man did not recover from his swoon until it was close to evening. Then, looking at the body of his son, he saw that what he had feared had come to pass. He slapped his face and his head and recited these lines. The loved ones left me with a broken heart, and floods of tears rain from my eyes. My longing is for what lies distant. But alas, how do I reach this? What can I say or do? I wish that I had not set eyes on them. What can I do, my masters, in these narrow paths? How can I find my solace in forgetfulness? The blaze of fire of love plays with my heart. I wish we had been joined by death in an inseparable link. In Allah's name, slanderer, go slow. Join me with them while this can still be done. How pleasantly we were sheltered by one roof, living a life of constant ease, until arrows of separation struck and parted us. And who is there with the power to endure them? A blow struck us through the dearest of all men, perfect in beauty, unique in his age. I called him, but the silent voice preceded me. My son, would that your fate had not arrived. How may I rush to ransom you, my son, with my own life? Were that acceptable? I say he is the sun, and the sun sets. I say he is the moon, and the moon's decline. The days bring sorrow and distress for you. I cannot do without you. None can take your place. Your father longs for you. But you are dead, and he is helpless. The envious look at us today to see what they have done, how evil was their deed. At that, with a deep sigh, his soul parted from his body. O master, cried the slaves, and poured dust on their heads. They wept more and more bitterly. They then took back all that was in the subterranean dwelling to the vessel. Then they put his body on the ship beside that of his son, and unfurling the sail, they passed out of sight. I came down from the tree, went through the trap door, and thought about the youth. Seeing some of his belongings, I recited, I see their traces, and so melt with longing, weeping in places where they used to dwell. I ask Allah, who decreed that they should leave that one day he may grant that they return. I remained, O my mistress, by day hiding myself in a tree, and at night walking about the open part of the island. Thus I continued for the space of two months, and I perceived that on the western side of the island, the water of the sea every day retired, until after three months the land that had been beneath it became dry. Rejoicing at this and feeling confident now in my escape, I got up and waded through what water was left until I reached the mainland and arrived at an expanse of sand. 
There I encountered sand dunes in which camels would sink up to their hocks, whereupon I emboldened myself and crossed it. I then saw in the distance an appearance of fire. I made for it, hoping to find relief. Meanwhile, I recited, It may perhaps be that time will direct its reins towards some good, but time is envious. Were it to aid hopes and fulfill my needs, it might bring pleasure after this distress. And advancing towards it, found it to be a palace, overlaid with plates of copper, with a door of brass, which, reflecting the rays of the sun, seemed from a distance to be fire, and when I drew near to it, I was delighted at the sight, and sat down opposite the door, reflecting upon this sight. Scarcely had I taken my seat, there approached me an old sheikh, accompanied by ten young men, wearing splendid clothes, who were all blind of one eye, at which I was extremely surprised. As soon as they saw me, they saluted me, and asked me my story, which I related to them from first to last, and they were filled with wonder. They then conducted me into the palace, where I saw ten benches, upon each of which was a mattress covered with a blue stuff, and each of the young men seated upon one of these benches, while the sheikh took his place upon a smaller one, after which they said to me, Sit down, O young man, and ask no questions respecting our condition, nor respecting our being blind of one eye. Then the sheikh arose and brought to each of them some food, and the same to me also, and the next he brought to each of us some wine, and after we had eaten, we sat drinking together, asking me about my circumstances, and my adventures, and their questions, and my replies, until the time for sleep, when the young men said to the sheikh, Bring to us our accompanied supply, upon which the sheikh arose, and entered a closet, from which he brought upon his head ten covered trays. Placing these upon the floor, he lighted ten candles, and struck one of them upon each tray, and, having done this, he removed the covers, and there appeared beneath them ashes mixed with pounded charcoal, and grime from cooking pots. The young men then tucked up their sleeves above the elbow, and blackened their faces, and slapped their cheeks, exclaiming, We were reposing at our ease, and our impertinent curiosity suffered us not to remain so. They thus did until the morning, when the sheikh brought them some hot water, and they washed their faces, and put on other clothes. On witnessing this conduct, my reason was confounded. My heart was so troubled that I forgot my own misfortunes, and I asked them the cause of their strange behavior, upon which they looked towards me, and said, O oh, young man, ask not respecting that which doth not concern thee, but be silent, for in silence is security from error. I remained with them a whole month, during which every night they did the same, and at length I said to them, I conjure you by Allah to remove this disquiet from my mind, and to inform me of the cause of your acting in this manner, and of your exclaiming, We were reposing at our ease, and our impertinent curiosity suffered us not to remain so. If ye inform me not, I will leave you and go my way. For the proverb saith, When the eye seeth not, the heart doth not grieve. On hearing these words, they replied, We have not concealed this affair from thee, but in our concern for thy welfare, lest thou shouldest become like us, and the same affliction that hath befallen us happen also to thee. Ye must positively inform me of this matter. There is no help for it, I said, unless you allow me to leave you and go back to my family, so that I may no longer have to watch all this. We gave thee good advice, they said, and do thou receive it, and ask us not respecting our case, otherwise thou wilt become blind of one eye like us. But I persisted in my request, whereupon they said, 
O young man, if this befall thee, know that thou wilt be banished from our company. They then all arose, and taking a lamb, slaughtered and skinned it, and said to me, Take this knife with thee, and introduce thyself into the skin of the ram, and we will sew thee up in it, and go away. Whereupon a bird called a roch will come to thee, and taking thee up by its talons, will fly away with thee, and set thee down upon a mountain, then cut open the skin with this knife, and get out, and the bird will fly away. Thou must arise as soon as it hath gone, and journey for half a day, and thou wilt see before thee a lofty palace, encased with red gold, set with various precious stones, such as emeralds and rubies, and if thou enter it, thy case will be as ours, for our entrance into that palace was the cause of our being blind of one eye, and if one of us would relate to thee all that had befallen him, his story would be too long for thee to hear. Welcome to the vocabulary section for episode 11. First, let us look at the terms that were used in this episode. Lodestone, magnetite possessing polarity or something that strongly attracts. Notches, a wee-shaped indentation. Capola, rounded vault resting on a circular base and forming a roof or a ceiling or a small structure built on top of a roof. Rakaz, supplications performed by Muslims as part of the prescribed obligatory prayer known as Salah. Ajib, an Arabic name meaning wonderful. Draughts, also known as checkers. Ruh, a mythological bird also known as a rock. Blue stuff, the color of mourning. Sheath, a case for a blade as of a knife. Hawks, the tarsal joint or region in the hind limb of a digigrade quadruped corresponding to the human ankle. Khadib, an Arabic name meaning pigment, suffuse, or paint. Vaulted, built in the form of a vault. Confession of faith. Fundamental expression of Islamic faith and the core of all Islamic law. The confession of the faith in Islam is La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah or There is no God but God and Muhammad Wasallam is his prophet. Nosegays, small bunch of fragrant flowers or herbs tied in a bundle often presented as a gift put to the nose for pleasant sensations or to mask unpleasant odors. Dais, a low platform for a lectern or a seat of honor. Now let's look at the vocabulary. Practicable, capable of being put into practice or being done or accomplished. Aperture, an opening or open space. Coquetry, a flirtatious act or attitude. Beneficence, the quality or state of doing or producing good. Contrary, a fact or condition incompatible with another and or a pair of opposites. Brazen, made of brass or sounding harsh and loud like struck brass. Intimated, marked by a warm friendship developing through long association or an informal warmth or privacy. Impertinent, given to or characterized by insolent rudeness not restrained within due or proper bounds especially of good taste doth archaic present tense third person singular of do predicament condition or state especially difficult perplexing or trying situation distress pain or suffering afflicting the body a bodily part or the mind supplication to make a humble entreaty to pray to God. Ascent, the act of rising or mounting upwards. This episode has been written, edited, and produced by Saf Big. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day and or night. 
and may the journeys on which you are set upon be fruitful. Thank you for listening.